Pour écouter cette session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionner le drapeau français. Hello. Bonjour. Habari Zaleo. On behalf of ICLE Africa, the Africa Center for Cities, our future cities. Surge Africa and the Red Cross Crescent Climate Center. We are delighted to welcome you to the Rise Africa 2023 Action Festival. Rise Africa is a platform that brings together thinkers, doers and enablers to inspire action for sustainable cities. This is the third edition of our virtual festival. It brings together insights, practices and visions from across the continent. This year's theme is the cities we want. The cities we want. The cities we want. The cities we want. This mirrors the African Union 2063 agenda vision. The Africa we want. It is a wonderful pan-African call for transformative change. However, the agenda does not adequately embrace urbanization as a potential positive force for improving prosperity, inclusivity, and environmental well-being on the continent. We need more emphasis on the role of cities and local action. And this festival aims to provide inputs into this agenda. The cities we have are Expanding, incomplete, inventive, contested, facing impending crisis yet brimming with potential. The cities we want are people-centered, safe and healthy, beacons of culture, unflinchingly modern, and adapting to change and leading global innovation. We'll make these cities through experimenting, learning, collaborating, and amplifying the everyday actions of people who are shaping their cities. The festival invites you to embrace different ways of knowing. It invites you to forge new partnerships, experiment with new concepts and ideas, to seek ways to bridge science, business, policy and the arts. Together, let's enter this space in the spirit of poetic possibilities. The cities I want, I already have. In people, all of us children, mommy sons and daddy's daughters, not raised ideally, but we're still proper. Carrying dust of townships on our skins, unwashable identities and unsolvable complexes, crisscrossing each other with dance, loving where hatred has tried, succeeding where governments have failed. I see monuments in this life standing here, deities to be worshipped after now, each one gods in their own rights, kings and queens of the yellow and black. We live here together, synchronized dreamers in a city that never sleeps, yet there is still one person left grinding on the streets when you write about a place like Lagos. We do not convolute the language. Come meet us where joy has found us, on the streets where art has found voice, and dance theaters raised on canals, and open mics staged on wooden bridges. I found my cities here in the people, full of life, each one a road rager, each one a mouthful of curses, each one a mouthful of blessings, each one a hand full of blessings, because that's how it ought to be. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Africa Day to all of you. Um, my name is Blake Robinson, and I'm connecting from uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, this session here today, um, entitled Servicing Slums, Alternative Approaches to Infrastructure in Informal Settlements, is part of a collaboration between the African Centre for Cities at the University of Cape Town and the Urban Future Studio here at Utrecht University. And I'm very pleased to be introducing what is our second session at Rise Africa, following a launch last year at a session titled Shifting Systems, Infrastructure Innovation for Sustainable African Cities, which you can find on YouTube if you're interested to watch that as well. Our team from Utrecht University and from um, the African Centre for Cities is um, at, on the ACC side, Edgar Peterson, who's leading the team, along with Inessa Makina and Tanasha Kanosvamira, who are here on the call with us today. And then on our side at Utrecht University, we have Professor Martin Heyer and myself and my colleague, Josephine Chambers, who's also on the call here today. So following the launch of our project called African Urban Futures last year at RISE Africa, 
we held an exhibition in November at the African Infrastructure Futures Conference, which aimed to elevate the status of African innovations in the infrastructure space. We produced a series of banners that hung from the ceiling in the conference venue with stories about really interesting initiatives from across the con continent that in some way um, express this idea of what sustainable infrastructure might look like. Building on this idea, we have um, done a bit further research in the last few months, and we will, at the end of this session today, be introducing a brand new website called infrahub.africa, which showcases these and a number of other case studies that focus on trying to understand what an African solution to sustainable urbanization might look like. And we believe that this is an important step in helping Africa to envision a sustainable future that doesn't necessarily have to copy ideas from other parts of the world or apply those, but where we can use our own ingenuity to develop solutions that really work for the context. So please stay to the end of the session where we will be launching and giving a quick run through the website and its features. I'm very pleased today to introduce a number of great speakers from across the continent. Uh, Abigail Aruna from Clean Team in Ghana, Esther Fugbo from We Cyclers in Nigeria, and Greg Midlane from DCGO in South Africa. I'm also very pleased to welcome Litebojo Makele, who's going to be our facilitator for today. And Litebojo is the Program Manager of Sustainable and Resilient Cities at the South African City Networks, where she focuses on the institutional and governance shifts that are needed to transition our cities to more sustainable cities. She's a seasoned program manager and sustainability specialist with 20 years experience across the public and private sector and a focus on applied research, environmental sustainability and urban infrastructure. She is a Danida Fellow, a Salzburg Global Seminar Fellow and a mentor on the Emerging Urban Leaders Program. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Lita Bojo, to introduce the speakers and to start the discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Blake. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Whether you come from a city where the elaborately decorated matatus are the order of the day, or from a city where you ride a taxi and not a taxi and have to shout short left from the back row seat to signal to the driver that you'll be getting off soon, or whether you're joining us from a city where you can't even imagine the fear of dodging flying toilets or the indignity and inconvenience of sharing one toilet with 50 other families in your neighborhood while at the same time traversing and navigating your way through piles and piles of stinking and rotting waste, or whether you're joining us from a city where you know what it feels like to worry when the sun begins to set because you know what challenges the darkness brings to your household. Whether these issues are yours to grapple with every day in one way or another, or whether you cannot relate to some or any of them, Happy Africa Day and thank you for joining us in this session on servicing slums where we will hear and learn about alternative approaches to infrastructure in informal settlements where the realities and lived experiences of a significant number of our fellow Africans will be looked at through the eyes of change makers, innovators, and those who believe that small and incremental steps in local level action are really necessary, they are possible, and they can transform lives in impactful ways. Please feel free as participants to engage with our speakers through questions, comments, and observations using the chat function. And later on, we will open the mics after the presentations to allow you as participants to then directly speak to our, to our panelists, if you so wish. We have three speakers lined up, as Blake has already mentioned. And we're going to start off along the West Coast of Africa with the clean team who are doing incredible work in Kumasi, Ghana, providing a container-based sanitation service. Our first speaker is Abigail Aruna, who is CEO of Clean Team Ghana Limited, which is a social enterprise that provides dignified household toilets to low-income communities in Kumasi, Ghana. She is a supply chain professional 
with an MSc in supply chain management and a Bachelor of Arts degree in geography and rural development. Abigail has over a decade of experience in waste management, value chain leadership, and occupational health and safety. She's also passionate about leading the clean team to become a sustainable sanitation business, providing dignified toilets across Africa, and is keen to mentor and support the growth of a new breed of authentic leaders for Africa. So if you're looking for a mentor in that area, Abigail is your lady. So we're going to start, Abigail. Thank you so much. Um, I'll hand over to you. And please unmute yourself, Abigail. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize that. No problem. Thank you for the introduction and um, good day to everyone. And um, happy African Union Day. Um, to explain or to talk more about what I do, I have some slides I would want to share. Um, let me quickly do that. And I will give more information about what we do in Clean Team. Um, can you see my slides, please? Yes, we can, Abigail. You can put it okay. on slideshow mode. Is that Perfect. okay? Yeah. So um, I think you've said everything about me and um, I will not want to add more to that. I will just go straight to talk about Clean Team Ghana Limited and what we do. So like you rightly said in your introduction, Clean Team is in Kumasi and um, we started operations in 2012. So we are about 10 years in, in, in our business. And um, Kumasi is the second largest city in um, Ghana with over 3.5 million uh, residents. 40% of these residents rely on public toilets and less than 10% um, use um, sewer, are connected to um, sewer systems. The rest use um, cesspit tanks that um, would suspect MTS would, would empty when it's getting full. But for those who don't even have access to public toilets, they would have to use flying toilets or find other ways to um, respond to nature's call. Some of these pictures just depict the, the sanitation situation in Kumasi. The first picture is that of a pet latrine, usually public, um, a lot of people use it. We also have pet latrines in homes that would have a wooden seat. And you mentioned flying toilets. It's, it's a common thing to see in um, informal uh, settlements in Kumasi. And this queue of people you see in the bottom left picture are actually people queuing for their turn to use the public toilet. And this is common sight in the mornings and evenings. The flash toilet is the aspiration, but not everyone can have it. Um, sometimes because it's too expensive, sometimes because they don't have space for it. And um, all these people would have to find a way to respond to nature's call. And that is where Clean Team comes in to provide uh, an option for people to have a household toilet. And um, we do this by providing a portable plastic toilet that requires um, no water. You don't need water to use it, neither do you need electricity. I prefer to call it a sustainable toilet. And um, all our customers need is a square meter of space to put a toilet. It's a urine diverted toilet and it's a dry toilet. So um, it has a space that separates the urine from the waste. As you can see in the uh, first picture on the right, that is the seat showing where the urine goes and the waste goes into um, the black hole. And the waste comes into a bucket. As you can see in the bottom right picture, we call it a cartridge and we provide customers a dry additive that they would use to cover the waste after every use. And the dry additive serves as a barrier between the waste and the next user and keeps the waste dry. The urine passes through the tube to the back of the toilet. Um, for customers that have the toilet in their bathrooms, the urine goes into their bathroom gutters. But um, if it's not in their bathroom, we give a container to collect the urine and the customers dispose of the urine themselves. This is not a challenge for customers because um, it is normal practice for people to take a chamber pot into their bedrooms at night to use 
to use and dispose of the urine, but customers do not want to have anything to do with their waste. We do not sell the toilets, but customers pay a monthly subscription fee for the waste collection, which is about six, 68 cities. That is around $7 a month to have a toilet at home. This is how the clean team module works. So we install a toilet for a customer. This takes less than 15 minutes to install a toilet. We have a team of waste collectors that would visit customers' homes twice a week to collect their waste. This is put in trucks that would, um, that would do the micro sites, pick from different spots, put it in a bigger truck that takes it to a waste processing site where the cartridges are cleaned and refilled and the waste is turned into a compost. So for the environmental benefits that Clean Team provides, we are collecting over a hundred tons of waste every month. These tons of waste would have ended up in gutters and in the community and causing sanitation, uh, sanitation related diseases like cholera and typhoid. But we are taking all this waste out and turning it into a compost. I would say that um, for the past 10 years, since we started operations, I have not heard about cholera in, in Kumasi even though we've had several cholera out outbreaks in Accra. I would attribute the fact that there's not been cholera outbreaks in Kumasi because of the work clean team does. All the waste we are moving out is keeping the city clean and keeping people safe from desanitation related diseases. Our customers are very happy with our service. And um, so you can see pictures of our customers in this slide. So far we've reached over 3,400 households with our toilets and impacting the lives of over 17,000 people. We are selling every day and we are looking to reach um, over about 4,000 by close of year. But in, by 2026, we should reach over 5,000 um, households with our toilets and um, be getting to building a sustainable business that will not have to rely on um, external support. These are, this is a picture of our staff during our 10th anniversary celebration. I would say we have very dedicated staff that I feel are all very passionate about the work they do. It takes a lot of passion to work in sanitation and each of our staff are very proud of the work they do in clean team. And um, we have over 65 staff, full-time staff that are working for clean team and making sure that our customers are well-serviced and all the waste is collected and safely disposed of. Yeah, so in a nutshell, um, that is what Clean Team does. Thank you very much, Abigail, for that presentation and really showcasing what um, an alternative approach to addressing some of the sanitation challenges in Kumasi are. And I like the fact that you're hitting a lot of um, objectives of sustainable development, the economic, um, environmental, and social aspects, um, but most importantly, the health um, implications of not having proper sanitation cannot be um, overemphasized. And I'm sure some of our participants joining us today um, are interested to hear more about the user perceptions and how mindsets had to shift, if any, um, because people want flushing toilets, I suppose, everywhere. Um, but also how do people utilize the service and are you getting customers through word of mouth or are you doing intensive marketing, um, et cetera. But we'll get into some of those questions um, later on. Um, we are going to move on to the next speaker. Um, I'm not sure if Esther has joined us yet. I don't see her, but if you are here, Esther, please let me know. Otherwise, we're I'm going here. to move. Oh, you are wonderful, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to, so we're remaining in West Africa and we're going to take a skip, hop and a jump over from Ghana, over Togo, over Benin into Nigeria um, to hear from Esther Fagbo, who's the head of business development at Recyclers Nigeria Limited, which is a for-profit enterprise 
providing convenient recycling services in densely populated urban neighborhoods. Esther has overseen the implementation of several community recycling collection kiosks, office recycling initiatives, and cleanup and sensitization programs. And she has brokered and managed partnerships with top local and international brands. Esther recently concluded a contract with Sahara and Lagos State Employment Trust Fund to set up 12 recycling collection kiosks in Lagos. Through her leadership at Fair Plastic Alliance, she has helped to build an inclusive circular economy in Nigeria that supports the dignity of waste pickers, leading a team of 52 volunteers from different parts of the world. Um, please go ahead, Esther, and share your screen and tell us more about the work that you are doing at Recyclers. Over to you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm not in Lagos, Nigeria currently, so um, a bit, I don't know what to say, but <laughs> I'm not in my comfort Dis zone. Disorientated. <laughs> I just had to take this because everybody in the team was like, you should take it. So, um, thank you so much for having me. I'm trying to join from my computer so that I can share my screen. Otherwise, I'll send it to um, Anuse so that she can share from her end. I don't know if that works. Um, I already sent the presentation. So. Hi everyone, Thanks. it's nice to meet you all. Um, today I'm going to start off by telling you a story of Ia Daniel. So Ia Daniel is a single mother in Nigeria. She's three, um, she has three children. Um, before learning about recyclers, she was earning about $20 monthly um, from her neighborhood um, sale where she sells things and she could barely make like ends meet. Um, after Ia Daniel heard about us and what we we're doing with plastics and other recyclables, she started to um, recycle with us and she started making money. Um, for the December 2020 redemption exercise, a redemption exercise is a time in recyclers where we pay cash incentives to people who bring their recyclables to us. So in December 2020, Ia Daniel earned over two thousand dollars in the 10 months and um, we just purchased a piece of land and she's currently building a house hopefully when she's done building a house we all at recyclers will be there to you know launch the house and celebrate with her and that story is that story is just one of the stories that we have heard in recyclers about how the, the work that we're doing is impacting life and changing life personally for me I am in the organization because every other day, I am happy that we give women opportunities to pay their children's school and we refuse to give in. The average subscriber in recyclers earns more than the minimum wage that is paid in Nigeria today. And that is a lot of things for us. Um, the problem is that in Nigeria, like many African countries, we have um, we produce a lot of plastics waste, about 2.5, thank you for sharing the screen, about 2.5 million tons of plastics is generated annually, and only about 8% of that plastic is recycled. You know, Lagos is a city that has high rate of unemployment. In fact, KPMG recently told us that 41% of unemployment rates now in 2023, that's to tell us that there are so many people that are not employed. And with our system, we're now creating a solution. So what happens to the waste that is generated? Can you move to the third slide, please? Thank you. That's yeah, Daniel all. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this slide, yeah. So, so they're, um, they're dumping of waste, they dump it anyhow, they burn the waste, and then there's no proper collection. The landfill in Lagos is already causing like a big environmental problem to the extent that it caught fire some from some years ago, like two years ago, and people are not able to live in that environment. So with all of this, we have come up with a solution and um, we've come up with a solution and our solution is, can you take it to the um, fifth, the sixth slide? 
So we cyclists now provide household and organization in developing countries with a chance to capture from their waste. What we do is we have developed we cycles that are small bicycles and vans and tricycles to go into neighborhood to collect recyclables from people. We have also developed an app that when you register with us, you get a customer number. You also get like a point on your phone, like your bank, um, like your bank app. So you get an alert to say, oh, you have generated X amount of plastic. So say today you generated 10 points from the plastic that you have brought to us. And then you bring another plastic tomorrow. And that's another 10 points, that's like 20 points. So you get an alert to say today you brought 10 points added to your previous 10 points and today it is 20 points. So that way we are able to collect these recyclables and convert them to points for our subscribers at the end of the quarter, that's April, August, and December, we pay our subscribers cash incentive. The subscribers get these points redeemed. And we do this because we're able to build these materials and sell to off takers. Very soon, we, we look at converting it end to end, that is managing the end to end production of the plastic, like producing the other plastics. Um, with our solution, we have been able to, you know, finance over 20,000 households. We have also converted over 9,500 tons of recyclables. We have over 100,000 beneficiaries and we have created over 200 direct jobs. My job inclusive. <laughs> and in 2019, we made a revenue of $420,000. And that is to tell you how much we can do with recyclables, how much we can do with plastics, how much we can do with the things that we call waste. Um, recently, we secured um, our first Series A funding, and that was to the tune of $2 million. And with that, we're going to create additional over 800 jobs across states in Nigeria. Currently, we're servicing about 23 locations in Lagos State. We have in other states, Lagos State is like the biggest city in Nigeria. We have other states like in um, Adamawa, in Abuja, and now with this funding, we are going to expand to other locations and then would have like other people have opportunity to recycle their waste and earn a living from it. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that is all. We're, we're, we're over 10 years in operation. And yes, yeah, so that is all. I'm happy to take questions. Sorry if I was, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so no, thank you. Have Thank you so much, Esther. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience that are keen mm -hmm. to learn from what you're doing um, and see the similarities in terms of context in their own cities. Um, we'll mm -hmm. take questions um, later on um, from the audience. Right now, we're going to now move to our last speaker who will take us all the way from the west coast of Africa down to the southern tip of the continent. Well, not exactly where the two oceans meet, but a bit inland um, to Johannesburg and into the informal settlement of Dipsluot. Um, now, many of you would um, have heard of or know of or are actually going through the current energy crisis in South Africa and how what we call load shedding here is impacting small businesses and the urban poor. But as Greg will show you, load shedding is not really an issue when you are starting from a position where you don't have any connection at all to any energy source in the first place. So Greg, um, Midlane, is the managing director of DC Go, a microgrid developer providing solar PV electrification in informal settlements in South Africa. Under his leadership, DC Go has made tremendous progress in providing access to electricity for underprivileged communities. He's an exceptional chartered project professional accredited in the UK with over 10 years of experience as company director in the energy sector and more than 17 years of experience in project engineering and commercial management. Greg has a deep passion for energy projects and business and a proven track record in the development and management of successful energy projects in the renewables and base load sectors. We're looking forward to an enlightening um, presentation, Greg. 
um, on how you're facilitating access to affordable solar energy solutions. You may go. Uh, Boho, thank you for the for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Greg. I'm the managing director of DC Go. Um, as the Litabocho said, uh, we're a microgrid developer um, based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly so you can get a better of idea of what uh, of what DC Go is is doing to solve the energy pro problem in the energy issues in the areas in which we work. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can, Greg. Thank you. So DC Go was uh, founded back in 2016, 17. Um, as the Boko said, uh, my background is in the renewables um, and baseload energy industries. I've been lucky enough to work um, across the world in the UK, Europe, across the African continent, um, and for the last uh, 10 years or so in uh, in the South African market. Um, for, for the majority of my career outside of DC Go, I was involved in the um, development and implementation of, of large-scale um, energy projects. Uh, one of the challenges with these projects, so, well, a couple of the challenges, as you know, are usually they take uh, a lot of time um, and a lot of resources and, and, um, and are very expensive to get uh, through the feasibility process um, to financial close. And if one in 10 projects reaches financial close, uh, you've, done, you've done very well. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, a lot of the large scale projects uh, feed directly into the national grid of the various countries in which we work um, and in which we live. Um, and there are still a huge number of, uh, still a huge number of people across the continent of Africa specifically that don't have access to electricity. Uh, the the numbers, you know, you, you always hear the 600 million people without access to to, to electricity on the continent. Uh, I was at the Lit Africa conference last week in Cape Town, where that number was mentioned as 700 million. So, um, even though there's significant project development on the continent, um, many many millions of people are not uh, getting access to this electricity. Um, this is where the idea of DC Go came from. Um, and it's developed to the point where we have now installed infrastructures to serve approximately 8,000 households. Um, and our intention is to, is to increase uh, the scale of our operation to um, upwards of 80,000 households over the next five years. That's in South Africa and also um, north of our, our borders into the continent. On the screen, you can see um, two photographs, the one on the left, uh, is um, well, they're both uh, pictures of our of our solar towers, uh, which we call them. Essentially, it's a it's a it's a five meter high mast um, that has panels and lithium batteries, some very clever um, remote monitoring and control software, and each of those each of these towers um, services approximately well up to sixteen up to sixteen households from basic electrification to include um, from basic electrification. And then televisions, um, televisions, refrigeration, um, and uh, obviously satellite television. This this unit here, uh, this one's quite interesting. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see we've got um, obviously each tower is installed with a street light, which provides street lighting at night in these areas. In South Africa, we currently have approximately three thousand three hundred informal settlements without access to any electricity. Um, this is due to various reasons, a lack of capital, uh, the land upon which they um, upon which they are situated uh, could be privately owned land or unproclaimed land, which prevents our energy utilities from providing electricity. Um, there, there is a, a large large scale migration of people from the rural areas to to the urban areas in South Africa, um, and we we cannot keep up with the pace. Of urbanization in terms of provision of um, of housing and basic services. So this is essentially where DC Go comes in. Um, and once we had, you know, started installing installing these solar towers, and they're installed in a in a grid pattern, approximately 70 meters apart throughout the community. Um, we we noticed other areas where um, where communities were lacking basic services. Uh, we're, we're currently in discussions with um, a, a, a LPG gas 
wholesaler to provide pay-as-you-go gas services for, for cooking and heating. And also, as you can see on the left-hand side, this black, uh, this black box towards the top of the mast, um, we, we realized that um, through obviously communicating with our towers on the GSM network using, using cell phone SIM cards, that the people in these communities don't have any access to, uh, to broadband internet. Uh, the only access is via mobile data, which uh, in South Africa is, is very expensive. So what we did, we ran a pilot um, in Deep Slurt, which is one of the five informal settlements in which we're currently operating in Johannesburg. This is where we connected um, fiber internet cable overhead uh, between our towers and then installed industrial routers and created a Wi-Fi mesh um, with broadband internet speed across a specific area of the, of the community. Um, and we're charging five rand per day for, for unlimited broadband, which calculates currently to about 25 US cents for 24 hours of unlimited data. Um, so um, essentially where, where we want to get to is to provide a, a, a number of basic services to, to the communities in which you operate, um, services that they aren't currently receiving, um, and then obviously try and grow that up through to, uh, through to the continent. Um, from an environmental and social point of view, we contribute to nine of the um, UN sustainability goals. Um, obviously, affordable and clean energy, um, a reduction in, in poverty through um, utilization of, of um, local, local contractors um, and provision of jobs, um, obviously with, uh, with, with the use of refrigerators and, and the ability to, to freeze and keep food cold, um, the, the, the food can be kept and, um, and, and reduce the requirement for buying food on a daily basis. Um, obviously, with with uh, electric lighting, it removes the requirement to burn um, to, to utilize paraffin or, or kerosene or candles within your household. Um, it's a, we we provide the ability of uh, for for school children and and students and adults um, to uh, to to study in the evenings um, through through obviously lighting. Um, we have approximately one hundred and twenty full-time um, staff and I'd say 90% of those staff are based in the in the communities in which we work um, and we've obviously created a signif significantly higher than that number of, of construction jobs um, and also through the addition of street lighting in our, our on, on each of our towers which we which we provide um, free of charge um, we provide obviously um, a safer environment for, for, for people to, to live after hours. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, and I look forward to your, um, to your questions later. If you'd like to go and have a look at our website, you can see the, um, the products which we're offering to our customers currently. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Greg, for showing us what being electrified means for communities who are constantly struggling with and juggling quite a number of livelihood challenges and yes. how much um, their quality of life is improved by just having um, connection to an energy source. Um, so thank you so much to all our speakers, Abigail, Esther and Greg. You know, you've all demonstrated these very practical and also contextually appropriate solutions to the provision of various types of infrastructure in informal settlements and how the solutions can also simultaneously um, fulfill critical social um, aspects or social challenges, um, but also hit on the environmental um, goals as well. But most importantly as well, improving the quality of life of people who live in these informal settlements and addressing some of their economic needs. So thank you so much for that. We're now going, going into the Q&A um, part of the session, which is the most exciting part because we then get to all be involved in the discussion. So please feel free to raise your hand um, through the raise hand function, um, and then you'll be able to speak to the um, presenters directly and ask your questions. Or if you're a bit shy, you can put um, your question in the chat and we will address 
those questions. Um, I'll just start off with a few questions so that we get um, the participants warmed up. Um, you know, for all three of you, um, I'm going to ask this question. We sometimes hear and read about um, the non-payment culture of low-income communities and people who live in informal settlements um, in our different city contexts. Um, people have this perception that um, people who live in informal settlements either can't afford certain services or they're not willing to pay um, for certain services and sometimes that's why they live in, in those informal settlements. But can you tell us um, how um, you've been able to shift that perception and offer affordable services to um, low income um, and informal settlement communities that they can actually pay um, for their services they receive? How have you managed to shift that perception and provide um, this affordable service? Um, so Abigail, I can... Okay, Greg, you can go ahead, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm jumping in there. Um... No problem. Well, for us to be able to provide a, an affordable service to our, our, our customers, um, we, we needed to look at what they were currently paying for their energy needs. Um, so what other sources of fuel or what have you they were using to, um, to, to, to light the house, to provide heat, to travel to and from the shops every day to, um, to, to get food. Um, and what we did was we calculated our the price which we would charge um, to our customer based on an energy cost replacement rather than an additional cost over and above of what they're already paying. Um, so we started with that affordable um, monthly payment in, in mind, and then we worked backwards with regards to the, the design of the technology um, and also the cost of capital the cost of operations to to allow us to um, to provide that um, that that service at an affordable level, whilst still providing um, a a fair return for shareholders and ensuring the business can operate sustainably going forwards, uh, without the requirement for for grant funding or or government inputs. Um, and uh, yeah, to date we've we've been successful. One of the one of the one of the key factors. Um, that that we need to make sure that we control um, in in the environments in which we work is is obviously stakeholder engagement. Uh, we do significant stakeholder engagement prior to implementing any of our projects or our services, um, and we do continual stakeholder engagement to ensure that we continue to meet the needs of the community. Um, we also obviously provide jobs and 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 work for for, for contractors of various types. Um, which provides us with our essentially our social license to operate within that community and be accepted within that community. We also make it very clear from day one that uh, we are not providing a free service. If that service, if if somebody wants that service, they 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 are required to pay for it. Um, that's very well explained in all the stakeholder engagements as well as um, daily engagements with our with our customers. Um, what is critical is that we provide a quality service um, for, for the price which people are paying. Like any market demographic, as long as you're providing the service that people are willing to pay for, then we see that the majority of our, of our customers pay on a continual basis. Um, the system is, is, um, is a pay-as-you-go system. So there's, no, um, there, there's obviously never any debt incurred by the customer. Um, and the payment is made for access to that energy for a specific number of days. It's either two weeks or a month. So once the, um, the payment is made at the beginning of the month, the customer has got comfort and security that they are not going to run out of electricity for the next 30 days. So we don't charge per kilowatt hour, we charge essentially for a fixed time period for a specific amount of energy, depending on what package they have. And yes, as long as we uh, put the customer first as long as we provide a quality service um, we we do see um, low well well uh, lower than expected um, default rates uh, we look we work between 75 percent and 85 percent of our customer base paying regularly thank you for that um, Greg that sounds like a really 
um, working model for your context. Um, I'd like to ask you to please keep um, put on your camera and keep it on for the duration of the Q&A as well as Esther and Abigail. Um, Abigail, how do you get people to um, pay willingly and um, an affordable service in your context? Yeah, um, I was just listening to Greg and I'm, I'm wishing that uh, my customers could, uh, like I would have a system that people pay before, before they use. Unfortunately, um, sanitation is the last on people's budget when it comes to toilets, like paying for toilets. People actually don't even budget for it because in our context, um, public toilets is pay as you use. But for our toilets also, in as much as we try to get customers to make prepayments, um, unfortunately, we can't lock up the toilets when they don't pay and prevent them from using. Um, yeah, we don't have that technology yet. But we have over 70% um, of our customers paying constantly. But then um, some of them still um, accumulate their debts over time. So what we do is that... Um, we give customers a three months grace period within which they have to pay. So um, if the first month the customer hasn't paid, the second month we send a reminder. And um, so we have a team of account managers that will call customers to remind them about their payment, guide them through the mobile payment pro um, process, put them on payment plans if they need be. But um, if the customer is not paying by the second month, we take the, the cartridge out and the customer cannot use the toilet. But we've had some customers find smart ways to still use the toilet, even when we take the cartridge out. Um, but by the third month, if the customer hasn't still made any attempt to pay, we pick our toilets. So um, yeah, we have some number of default rates that, that went really high during the COVID period when people didn't have, didn't go to work and all. And so for some of the customers that have been with us for a long time, we had to um, cancel some of their debts or give them a longer period to repay. But um, the other thing we've, the other things we've done to make sure that our service is affordable is um, is uh, looking for innovative ways to reduce our cost of service. So our service is still cheaper than using a public toilet. To use a public toilet is about one CD per day. So a family of about um, five would be spending over 180 cities every month using unhygienic public toilets. But our toilets is just um, 68 cities, which is $7. But if they're using public toilets, that's about $15 a month. So we get customers to understand that there is value in using the cleaning toilet and that even gives them savings. And they have the comfort of having a toilet at their home, in their home, and they can clean it and use it at any time of day. So there are customers who really appreciate that and would not want to lose the service and so would pay promptly. We also find innovative ways to make sure that we are not pricing our toilet in such a way that it is higher than the price of the public toilet. So we would find innovative ways to reduce our cost of service. Maybe I'll speak more to that when questions around that comes up. But one of the examples is um, initially we were using a chemical additive that we imported. And that was really expensive. But um, through research, we found that we could use some local uh, materials like sawdust. And that reduced our cost of service drastically, which meant that we didn't have to charge customers so much to be able to cover our cost of operations. And we are constantly looking for ways to improve upon what we do, improve our efficiency, so that we don't have to put too much burden on our customers and still maintain a very affordable service. Say like that customers can still pay or we can still save um, low income income communities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Abigail. Um, yes, it does sound like you give them um, some liberty for a number of months and then um, you then take control if payments don't come through. But glad to hear um, that you do get um, people who manage to sustain that. Um, there's a nice comment from Remy. Um, Remy, would you like to um, speak to the um, presenters about what you've put in the chat, which is quite a great um, comment, and then a question around um, the right public resources? 
please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, there is this myth that was expressed in a question that people are not willing to pay, uh, mm. and, and many enterprises are proving this wrong. Um, but the, there is another myth that all people are paying, so they can probably cover the cost of the service. And very often, enterprises start with high expectations, and, and funders are also pushing the sort of expectations that customer payments um, can cover the cost of the service. And for some business lines, it can be true, but for others, especially when it is a public service at heart, uh, it's it's usually not true. And on high-income countries uh, have been subsidizing the sort of services for, for a very, very long time, but sometimes have been forgotten, forgetting it now. Um, so, so there is a dilemma here in, in terms of um, these services need, need to be subsidized by the public sector, but at the same time, uh, we don't want this to kill the entrepreneurship spirit that exists and the, and the innovation that happens. And I know, you know my, my sector is, is sanitation, and like Abigail, but uh, I'm curious about the experiences in other sectors as well on this. Thank you. Mm, thank you so much, um, Remy. Perhaps, Esther, you can come in there. Um, how have you um, engaged? I understand from your presentation that you, you are incentivizing people to come with their waste uh, for you to then sell it off to um, recyclers. Um, have you engaged with um, the local government in any way around um, waste collection services in, the, in, in your area? And what has that been like? Okay, yes, we have, um, can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Esther, please go ahead. Okay, so you engage um, with the local government. We have, we have engaged with the local government people in our area, in fact, the state, the state government. So there is an agency in Lagos that manages waste. It's called LOMA, Lagos State um, Waste Management Authority. Um, so every year we have um, a subscription fee that we pay to them to enable us to collect recyclables from um, people to say that we are authorized by the government. So if there's anything we're doing, we have to be authorized by the government. You have to get government support to be able to deliver on anything that you're doing. If you don't have government support, you might not be able to really create the impact that you want to create. So you have to find out the, the agencies in your locality that is involved with um, waste management and whatever it is that you want to do and find out what they want from you. Also, we have gotten a grant from the government before to support our business. So I think that's also like a good thing that you get when you get when you get the support of the government. All right, thanks, um, Esther, emphasizing the importance of working together with the government and getting um, their support. I'll take a question from Razaz, and then we'll go to Andani in the chat. Razaz, um, hello, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the three presenters. Uh, really impressive projects. I particularly found the, the microgrid one amazing. And I have two questions, two quick questions. So the first question regarding, uh, like, how do you how do you work around the possibility of uh, having the grid accessing these areas? Like, do you foresee relocating the mass to other areas, or how do how do you work around that? And the second question is, um, have you have you worked with reliability seeking users with the same model, like in contrast to if of grid users? Thank you. Sorry, Razaz, please will you just repeat your second question? My second question regarding uh, having the same model, like the same package for reliability seeking users, like people who are just uh, like who are experiencing load shedding or something, in contrast to having to being off grid. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. Um, just with regards to your first question, um, the, the time frames between a, an, a, an informal settlement area being allocated for electrification and actually being electrified in South Africa is currently on average 12 years. Um, and obviously this brings significant challenges um, because one, even if 12 years later, the, 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 the project is implemented, the, 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 the community is most likely grown four, five, six, 10 times in size. 
so um, a large number of community members will still not receive um, access to, to grid electricity. Um, mostly, uh, we choose areas where um, there is not going to be any grid electrification for the next five years at least. Um, however, the majority of the areas in which we work have been there for uh, in excess of 25 years and, uh, and, and still have no um, grid electrification plans in sight. Um, secondly, um, in terms of, of, of providing a service uh, to, to mitigate against the effects of, of power failures um, and, and load shedding, as we call it in South Africa, which is a, which is a constant in our lives um, from, from late last year, um, you know, we, we are looking at, um, at alternatives for uh, alternative, alternative technologies um, to be able to provide the same type of service to, um, for want of a better wording, um, brick and mortar houses in, in the townships. Um, there are obviously a large number of service providers um, who are currently um, providing solar PV solutions in the in the in the high, higher LSM residential um, and commercial space, so the challenge we're trying to overcome now is to find um, a a technology model which will work um, in the in the more formal um, lower LSM areas, which will still allow us to provide a an affordable service to um, to the customer um, every month. Thanks, um, Greg. Yeah, the second. Thanks, um, Greg. There's another question in the chat from um, Andani. Andani, would you like to ask your question or should we read it? I can see the question there. Uh, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, the, our collaboration with, with government. Um, we... Uh, our, our, our business um, operates obviously within within all um, current legislation and regulations with, within South Africa. Um, this allows us to have a direct business to customer relationship without gaining a municipal or, um, or government approval um, before we implement a, a project. This is because our municipalities um, have executive rights um, over um, electricity distribution in their areas. However, they don't have exclusive rights, meaning our municipalities may um, may draft bylaws by which we or regulations by which we as a private energy company would have to comply. However, they cannot prevent us from, um, from, from actually um, implementing our projects. Um, having said that, um, there is one policy from our Department of Minerals and Energy um, which is the electrification of unproclaimed areas policy and the off-grid electrification policy, which states that we need to have um, approval of, of, of the local uh, municipal ward councillors and ward committees, which, uh, which, which, uh, well, which govern the areas in which our projects fall. And we also need to have, um, obviously, community buy-in and, uh, and approval for us to come and implement our project. And, and thirdly, uh, it says the, that the area cannot be electrified. Well, it's not planned for electrification within the within the next five years. So essentially, those are the the three items which we have to um, which we have to comply with uh, within existing policy. Um, and we we do extensive, as I said earlier, we do extensive um, stakeholder engagement prior to you know even attempting to. Um, to enter a community on a on a commercial basis, we we engage firstly with with ward councillors and and ward committees who represent the communities, um, who then provide us with uh, with with details for for the of the of the community leadership structures. Uh, we then engage obviously with 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 the various structures within the communities. Um, Deepslit, for example, has over twenty five thousand informal homes. So as you can imagine, there, there, there's a number of leadership structures which, uh, who, with whom we have to engage. Um, and then after we've had uh, community leadership buy-in, uh, we then do mass community meetings um, daily and obviously over weekends. Once we have buy-in from, um, from the entire community, um, 
only then do we start installing infrastructure and um, and and obviously signing up customers. Um, the the challenge challenges that we've had on your second question there um, are approving to communities that this is an alternative to to grid um, to AC grid electricity um, as as opposed to just the stopgap until um, an electricity uh, connection is is provided by by the municipality and that all comes down to um, being able to provide a um, a service that's up to up to the standard expected when you have a, an AC connection in your house. Um, and the other challenges we've had are obviously um, um, we, we've had theft. I would say the majority of of the theft issues we've dealt with are through overhead ca overhead cable theft. Uh, we install up to forty meters of overhead cable between our solar towers and 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 our customers. Um, we have, however, changed um, from a copper distributor to to aluminium um, about sixteen months ago. Um, and to date, touch wood, we have not had one of those cables stolen. Um, in the main, our um, our infrastructure is 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 very well looked after and cared for by by the communities. Obviously, another challenge we have is competing with illegal electricity connections. Um, it is interesting when you run a business whose main competitor is illegal, um, but uh, but yeah, that's one of the things we that, that we manage on a daily basis. Right. Thank you so much, um, Greg, for those responses and um, what is happening in, in your context. Um, I'd like to direct um, a question to Esther. Um, Esther, you know, what, um, how, how does the recycling market um, affect your business um, and how are you able to adapt um, to whatever changes um, happen in the recycling market. As you are incentivizing people to collect, then you off, um, sell off to um, recyclers. What, what, what are the market conditions there and how are they affecting your um, initiative? Esther? Um, okay. So, um, how is um, because we sell, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, because we sell to off pickers, um, we understand that um, during the rainy season, for instance, the prices of plastics would go down. And that means that we're not getting as much as we would get from plastics usually. So what we have done over the years is not to be in a hurry to increase the price that we pay as incentive to our subscribers. So before now we used to pay 10 naira per kilogram and then we, we started paying 20 naira per kilogram and then we started paying 40 naira per kilogram. Today we're paying 60 naira per kilogram. So we don't, we're not quick to increase the prices as soon as it increases in the markets. Because we know that with time, it will come down. And sometimes the prices changes because um, some, some recyclers have like a lot of people supplying them plastics at the time. And be, mm -hmm. because a lot of people have plastics at the time, they, they tend to want to buy at lower prices. So when they're buying at lower prices, we would not um we would not go back to reduce what we pay to people as incentive because that means that people will not trust you anymore. So so we have, we have a maintained price, a price that we have sustained for a while, and then we see the sustenance for at least a year before we change price. So even when the prices go up in the market, we're not quick to change price. For instance, we collect all colors of bottles, plastics, we collect the green, the brown the white and the clear. But in the market today, the green and the brown bottles, they don't have they don't have value as much as the clear and the white bottles, the clear and the blue bottles. So 
but, but we will not tell our subscribers, don't bring white bottles, don't bring brown bottles, or don't bring green bottles. So bring all of them, and then we'll collect all of them. But we will further segregate the materials, and then we'll sell the, the clear and the blue bottles to off takers. But I've also had conversations with, so with that, you, you see that, for instance, the value we are selling the green and the, and the blue bottles the green and the brown bottles is the is almost like the value we're getting it from our customers. So 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 you see, we're not quick to increase our prices when prices go up in the market. We remain we retain what we're paying the customers so that we're able to sustain it and also gain their loyalty. And then they trust us that whatever we have said that we're going to pay is what we would always pay them, and we're not going to go back on our words and and. And we've, and we've done this over the years. We've done this for 10 years now. We keep, even we increase prices, customers are happy and they're excited because they've come to trust us that we're able to sustain and keep to our words. Um, recently, Coca-Cola changed the color of their bottle, their Sprite bottle from green to clear because of the value in recycling. And so when we see organizations do this, we're able to say that, okay, there is going to be this change and the values of recyclables will continue to increase. But until then, we're not just going to increase the prices. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much, Esther. And I hear that you have to jump off soon. And thank you so much for, for joining us and your contribution um, to this discussion. Um, there are some wonderful questions coming in. Um, in the chat, um, Gareth, please go ahead, or would you like us to read your question? I'm sure it's fine if it's read. I, I know others have seen it, but yeah, those who want to chip in if they wish. Thank you. Yeah, so to the panelists, um, there's a question about um, the role that neighborhood scale um, and communal processes um, either add or constrain the success of the project. What has been your lessons? Um, Abigail, would you like to tackle that one? Yeah, I'm still trying to understand the question. So um, we're asking if some practices within communities support or have posed as challenges in our work. Sorry. Is that the yeah. case? Let me Can ask Gareth to explain it more. So Garrett? my question is based that you know, a lot of what I've heard is technical, managerial, et cetera. But what happens in servicing settlements is often down to the nature of how people interact and how the service providers engage. And it's been mentioned in, in part in all the presentations, but I was just trying to wonder how important that is to the success of a project, to be able to build community buy-in, to understand that Greg mentioned some of the processes that they have to go through with politicians and all, but just some of the lessons learned around how that, how the importance of that for the success, or maybe not. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I think community buy-ins are very important. And in our line of work, what we've realized is that there are influencers or opinion leaders in communities that if you are able to touch on them and they accept what we do, then they are able to influence other people to accept our product as well. But if they do not accept it, they can influence other people not to accept our service. So when we are entering a community, we would identify these um, opinion leaders. Some of them are political, like the assemblymen. We identify the local chiefs. We identify people that have influence within the community and talk to them, try to get their buy-in. And then they can also talk to people within the community. And that makes acceptance of our products easier. So if um, the people in the community have a trusted person telling them about the product or affirming that, oh, this is a good service, you can trust them, then people, um, it's easier to get people buy in or people to sign on to the service. But if on the other side, these opinion leaders or respected people within the community do not accept the service, then it becomes a challenge. So people will go to these opinion leaders with, with problems, with questions. And so we make sure that we um, give them enough information so that they can also become ambassadors of, of the service we provide. But um, yeah, these people are very critical when it comes to um, community, community acceptance and all. 
yeah that that is what i would, I would add in terms of our experience wonderful yeah, thanks yeah. and as these thumbs up from gareth um thanks so much there's a follow-up question um for you abigail from michael um in the chat um he wants to know whether how you were able to expand as a company and what was the source um, of the funding was it personally sponsored or was it found founded from external funded from external sources yes so um we have funding from external sources we've had um, some grants some loans yeah but we've had external funding but also um, we fund our um, activities with the subscription fees we collect from customers. So we get revenue from customers, but that is supplemented with, with funding. But um, like I said, we are working towards becoming a sustainable business like that we do not have to rely on external funding, but con can continue to run the organization with the revenues we are collecting from customers. That would mean that we have to expand through economies of scale. We have to reduce our expenses and yeah, get that, get that to work. Expansion, I would say, has been very intentional because what we do is service intensive. We do not just um, expand without planning. So we expand from one community to another. So we expand to the nearest community, like um, from our last customer, we, we extend to the nearest community. So we are not skipping communities, but are moving from one community to another. Say that we do not have to travel too far from our last customer to service the newest customer. And so we have intentionally and cautiously guided our growth, said that we do not grow too much or too fast, said that we are not able to provide a quality service. So mm. we are expanding intentionally, just so we can still keep the quality of our service. We can still pick the waste as promised when we have to pick it. Because if we do not do that, then um, we will not get referrals. And people would hear that this organization does not deliver on their service, on their promise. Mm -hmm. And so we actually would kill our market even before we, 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 we reach them. Yeah. And so we expand very intentionally from one community to another. All right. Thanks so much, Abigail. Um, Greg, did you want to come in there? Uh, yes, thank you. My, my comment was just for, um, for Gareth. I think it's, it's critical um in the initial um community engagement through um through whether they are politicians or um or, or local community leadership to make it very clear that the project is for community benefit and providing services to the entire community and not um for the for the benefit of any individuals um no matter what their position or or status may be um and it's also very uh, important to to not make any promises that cannot be kept. Um, in terms of uh, service provision, you need to be able to back up exactly what, uh, um, what you've said with your performance on the ground. Um, if, your, if your service isn't up to scratch, um, you will hear about it very quickly and it very quickly leads to um, discontent throughout the community as well as uh, a reduction in, in, in payments. Um, and I think that um, is, is, is true of any market. If you're not providing a good service, you're going to lose customers. I think one of the, um, one of the mistakes a lot of people make when working within uh, poorer communities um, is that somehow that this, this, this community is going to be, this market will be different from another market. It's, it's, it's all about providing good quality service um, and, and, and backing that up and, and being able to um, put your money where your mouth is ready. Thank you, um, Greg. So there's another question from Adeposi, which is around um, the existing government structures, whether they're formal or informal within the communities that you work in. Um, Abigail mentioned that you need to get buy-in and you need the support of um, local um, councillors who then become the ambassadors. In your... Um, context, Greg, have you had any threats um, or discontent from ward councillors or um, informal governance structures within um, the community of Deep Um 
it, yeah, it depends where you, it depends where you, where you, uh, where those, where those, uh, you, you've got to, you've got to take each, um, each complaint or, or each um, expression of discontent uh, from where it comes. Um, yeah, we, we, we operate across five areas of, of Northern Johannesburg, so, and Pretoria, so not just Deep Slurt anymore. Um, I think in the early days of, of, us rolling out pilot projects and having discussions with uh, with, with with our local governments, um, there was definitely a feeling of, um, well, this is this is our this is, you know, our 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 property, and we and we need to provide these services. And if you do this, you're going to be taking away revenue from us. Um, we have obviously been engaging for a number of years. Um, and we do clearly state that we are not trying to compete with the municipality or compete with uh, with Eskimo National Utility. Uh, we go into areas where um, where there is no access to service um, to an electrification service, and very unlikely that there will, in the near future, or ever be, um, you know, formal grid connections. Um, so the the engagement with uh, with with government was always in the past one way us communicating with government, um, that's done a 180. Um, and a number of, um, of municipalities around the country have been approaching us and, and National Department of Housing, et cetera, um, to, to partner to, to try and solve this, this crisis of, of unelectrified uh, communities. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, yes, it just shows the complexity as well of um, going into communities and um, providing um, a service that should necessarily be provided by um, government like other people put forward, um, and then how the relationships need to be brokered um, between the different stakeholders, but getting a good response from um, national and provincial government is a good step forward. Um, we're going to move to another question, um, which is around assumptions that you as uh, project developers, as social entrepreneurs made when you first um, went into um, these um, neighborhoods. What um, assumptions did you have and how had, have you had to adjust um, your approach based on the context that you find yourself in? Um, Abigail? Yeah. So, um, like I said, our service is, uh, like I said earlier, our service is targeted at um, low-income communities. But as we have um, exhausted low-income communities that are within the city center, we have started moving to peri-urban areas. Those who have um, all parts of um, those peri-urban areas that have compound houses and um, used to have uh, bucket latrines that have been phased off. And so the assumption is if you go to any low, um, any community, we will look out for the old parts of the towns and they would possibly need toilets. But sometimes you go into a community or you hear the name of the community, you go to do your scout and you realize that no, um, these people may not be able to take our toilets because um, they do not have space because they cannot afford it or for some various reasons. So our assumption uh, before going into the communities sometimes are usually um, um, challenged. And so what we would first of all do is drive through, talk to people, understand what the practice in the community is, what kind of toilets they have. Some of the communities would prefer to still use public toilets if they have good ones. Others would need our service, but the road will be so bad, it will not make sense for us. It will not make economic sense for us to go and service them. Others you would see and feel like, oh, this community may not have toilets, but they actually could have um, toilets. And um, it's also got us to redefine who our customers is, who our customers are. Are we targeting only low income communities or are we interested to give people toilets? Well, depending on their economic status. And so should we just be relying on providing only low income communities with toilets? Can we look at other options that would fit other classes of people that do not also have household toilets, but want to have their own toilet? And so 
um, that has helped us diversify our services from just container base, but also look at um, other sanitation services that we can provide to meet people's uh, needs. Because yes, some people will not have toilets, but they prefer other kinds of toilets with container base. Can we give all these people options? So um, I think some of these things we meet or some of these challenges we meet out there just helps us to redefine what our business is or what we want to do going forward to be able to reach more people with dignifying sanitation options. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I guess it also links to what we, you said earlier about being intentional about your expansion and which areas you, you then focus on. Um, for you, Greg, what were your assumptions and did you have to change your approach a bit or not? Um, you know, anybody um, who has not spent time in informal settlements like I have, um, in, in South Africa specifically, there are uh, perceptions that they are very dangerous places, no-go areas, um, that um, the, there's, there's high unemployment, um, they are dangerous, et cetera. Um, you know, we, we've spent five years in Deep State, which is which is our largest area now. Um, and I would say that all of those uh, assumptions are, are completely wrong. I would say that 95% of people are, uh, are wonderful. They're just trying to find a, a place to live, to go and do their job and raise their children and send their kids to school, just like anybody else. Um, there is a small component that uh, is involved of people that's involved in criminality. Um, we've seen, um, you know, fantastic um, results coming out of people that that, that we've employed from uh, employed and trained and, and and people that have had multiple promotions um, with with uh, within our business. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think just because people live in informal settlements, they often get looked over uh, overlooked um, by by government as and and in the private sector as as problem areas um, instead of. Um, instead of just another area to, to actually provide services to. Um, and that's where the likes of DCGO and other companies um, come in. Um, and, you know, it's, it's completely changed my, my perception, really. And it's, it's not a, um, it, an informal settlement um, is unfortunately um, not a very, um, uh, not a very um, a, a great place to, to live when compared with, uh, you know, formal, formal suburban areas or, or rural areas. Um, however, this is uh, something that's, uh, that's here to stay. Um, and uh, we all need to work together to, um, to improve living conditions in, the, in these areas, uh, rather than just try and uh, sweep it under the rug and hope it goes away. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for those reflections, um, Greg. And I'm glad that. One more thing. Yes, yes, please go ahead, Abigail. Yeah. The other thing I found was that um, when we say low, low income communities, it's not everyone within low income communities that is poor. Some of, a lot of them have resources. But um, when it comes to defining sanitation, I'll say, but they are sanitation poor because maybe they have money to build the aspirational cesspit um, tank and have the toilet, but they don't have space to be able to build toilets. So yes, some low income community dwellers can afford to pay for, for services and, and even more. And even um, you realize that for every household you would go into, they have satellite televisions, they have all the modern gadgets that people need to have in their homes. Yeah, so that was another thing that surprised me in some of the communities we visited. Um, you're on mute, Ms. Boho. Ah, I'm muted. <laughs> you think after almost four years or three and a half years, we'll get used to unmuting and um, videos. Um, so thank you so much, um, Abigail um, and Greg, for those reflections. Um, one last um, question. So if you had a um, policymaker or decision maker or a financier or anyone who can 
dramatically change um, your operations for the better. Um, what, what message would you um, tell them and, and, and what would enable you um, to serve your customers more and better? Greg, I'll start with you. Uh, it's simple, Edwoho. I think, um, you know, South Africa has, um, you know, legislation around uh, the free basic electricity grant. Um, and for, for indigent people in South Africa, the government agrees or is, is legislated that it will provide a certain amount of, of, of energy um, per month free of charge. Uh, there are one or two examples of this in, in the off-grid or alternative energy. When I say alternative energy, I mean alternative to the national grid space um, where free basic electricity grants from National Treasury have, um, have, have worked. Um, what we need government to do is to, um, is to recognize um, private electricity providers, recognize their customers, um, and allocate that um, that free basic electricity grant to the customers. If we had to include the free, free well, if we had to reduce our um, our customers' uh, monthly service fee by the by the free basic electricity grant, um, our customers would be paying um, less than half of what they're paying now for 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 the basic service. Um, mm. So, you know, policy needs to be put in place where companies like ours can apply through the municipality to national treasury for those uh, for that free basic electricity grant to be passed on to our customers um, and for that money from national treasury to actually reach the end user rather than um, what often happens is that money is allocated to the municipality it goes into the municipality's um, fiscus however it's not spent where uh, it was intended for so if we could get some policy or structure around around free basic electricity for um, off-grid solutions um, in low-income areas, that would significantly, um, you know, assist our customers and ourselves in the process. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, Greg, so yes, looking at these different alternatives and what can work within certain contexts in terms of um, el electrification. Um, and for you, Abigail? Yeah, I'm just smiling because um, Greg just mentioned um, what is one of my biggest needs, government support. If government, providing basic sanitation is government responsibility and um, public toilets, uh, operators and other sanitation companies do not have to pay um, value added taxes. But for clean team, we still have to pay value added taxes. And that is making our operations um, very expensive. And just recently, this year, uh, government has introduced another tax, 5% tax, even on companies that are not making profits. So you pay 5% of all your expenses annually. And that is just kind of putting an extra burden on what we do. Meanwhile, um, we cannot increase our prices as rapidly as other organizations or other companies because um, people do not prioritize sanitation. And so you increase your price so much, you lose all your customers because they can go back to flying toilets. And so I would say taxes, um, is one of our biggest challenges. If government can waive some of these taxes for us, it would mean that we would get sustainability faster. And um, if government would also provide these basic subsidies like Greg, Greg said, it would go a long way to mean that we can even provide our services at a relatively um, cheaper cost than we are doing now. So um, government support, um, not just in kind, but in tax reliefs, in, in support, in grants and all that would, would really um, go a long way to make our businesses more sustainable and reach more people and yeah, make it basically um, cheaper and affordable for low income um, households. Thank you so much. Um, yes, government support, absolutely critical and doing what they, are mandated to do in the first place. Um, but like what Greg was saying, the pace 
of um, urbanization and people um, coming into cities is too fast for our city governments to, um, to keep pace with that and provide the services that are needed. But hopefully there could be some where, where um, you know, there's collaboration with um, organizations such as yourselves to then hold hands together to provide um, those services and make your work much easier instead of taxing you even more um, unnecessarily. Um, thank you very much um, to both of you and Esther in her, uh, her absence for drawing us into this possibility space um, of um, what service provision in informal settlements could be and helping us see these spaces in different ways. Um, and I'm sure with um, your work, you've seen as well um, how different it is looking from the inside out instead of looking from the outside in. And we're able to start reimagining um, for ourselves as well in our different city contexts, um, what it means to reconfigure and, and shape um, the cities we deserve, like the theme of um, this um, festival is um, today. So what can work for all of us um, and not just a few in our cities. So thank you for showing us your work and for being these amplifiers of um, innovative infrastructure provision and practices in our cities and recognizing that innovation is not just about um, technology, but thinking about um, solving um, challenges differently and generating ideas that address um, these social um, economic and environmental challenges that people face. I'm now going to hand over um, back to Blake um, and Tenashi. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to our participants for engaging. And the questions that you asked um, were quite really um, thought provoking and useful for all of us here. And I'm sure for Abigail and Greg as well to go mull over some of um, the, the questions and comments that were put in the in in in, in this forum. So thank you so very much. Um, over to you, Blake. Thank you so much, Lita Bojo, and to Abigail, Esther, and Greg for your fantastic presentations and your really amazing efforts in, in everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to try and help people around the continent and to do so in a sustainable way. We, we specifically chose these three different um, projects to showcase the variety of different things that are happening across the continent in different sectors that all in some way contribute to this idea of how could we create infrastructure for the poorest people in Africa so that we can achieve the SDGs and our climate goals um, in, in a way that's uniquely African. And this is very much a theme of the project we've been working on and the new database that we're going to be launching today. Um, so we, we wanted to look at this idea of, of what does sustainable infrastructure mean in an African context. And we realized that there's quite a big gap between the very formal um, global definitions of sustainable infrastructure, which are often quite abstract and not very useful in, in an African context. And then very specific sustainable infrastructure rating systems, which have many, many criteria and, and are quite difficult to implement practically. So we've developed a, a three basic rules that we've used to identify what is or could be considered a, an example of, of an infrastructure initiative that is sustainable. And we look at those that in some way benefit the poor. Um, that's our first criteria. So we exclude those that are exclusively for the wealthy. We look as a second criteria at ones that create decent local jobs. So we exclude those that uh, are contracted out to, to foreign service providers and don't leave any legacy of uh, capacity development or employment in the local market. And then we look at those that either minimize or reverse environmental damage. So they have some kind of an environmental benefit that sets them apart from the normal infrastructures that were built in the last century. So using those three criteria, we have uh, put together a database uh, called infrahub.africa, which we are very pleased to launch today at, at RISE Africa. Um, and this database looks at what we call infrastructure initiatives. So they range from experiments to pilot projects to products, services, apps, utilities. It's a very wide range, um, but they all in some way contribute to what infrastructure is supposed to 
uh, provide in a city. And I'm now going to hand over to our team to play a video that's been prepared by my colleague Tanashe to take you briefly through the website and its features. Um, so I'll now hand over to you, Eman. Welcome to our website, InfraHub Africa. Here we're excited to explore sustainable infrastructure examples from Africa to unlock new possibilities for more sustainable and equitable cities. To achieve this, we need you. Are you passionate about creating sustainable cities? Do you want to be a part of a global movement that promotes equitable urban development? Then you've come to the right place. Our website serves as a hub showcasing inspiring case studies of sustainable infrastructures from across African cities. We invite you to contribute to the website. I will now take you a quick journey through InfraHub Africa to show you its main features. Now, the first thing you'd want to know is how to explore case studies. So you simply click on explore case studies at the top of the menu. After this, you'll be taken to this page where you can search a wide range of sustainable infrastructure examples from renewable energy solutions and efficient transportation systems to innovative water management strategies and inclusive public spaces. You can search the database using keywords like sanitation or using the filters. For example, you have a filter where you can filter by country, for example, Ghana, or you can filter by infrastructure categories. So we have various other filters that you could use to improve your search results. The most important feature on this website is sharing your case study. And with this, you have to click on share your case study, which is at the bottom of this uh, website page or here on the tab. So you simply click on share case study. This will take you to this page where you'll find a straightforward form where you fill in information regarding uh, basic details about your project, including uh, the background of the project, sustainability features, and so forth. We get to attach a photo that shows the infrastructure, uh, perhaps documents that can tell us more about the infrastructure, uh, perhaps a website address, and importantly, a video link that you place in there. Once you are done, then click on share your case study and then your case study will be submitted to our team for review before it is published online. By contributing, you are not only doing a collection of sustainable infrastructures, but also becoming a part of a growing movement to inspire a more sustainable Africa. Important to note that for non-English speakers, InfraHub Africa is also available in French, also available in Portuguese, it's also available in Arabic and Swahili. In addition to that, it is optimized for mobile use. Once again, those are the key features on how to use the website to explore case studies, but also to share your case study. I invite you to join us on this exciting journey of exploration, inspiration and collaboration. Together, let's imagine and build more sustainable, equitable cities for future generations. Visit the website at www dot infrahub dot africa today thank you great thank you tanashe so i hope that's given you a taste of our brand new website infrahub dot africa and inspired you to go and have a visit and um, check out some of the features we also would really like to open up to all of you and, and to your networks to please help us build this database we've started with 20 case studies but we really want to grow this into a central hub where anybody can add case studies and share examples and inspire others from across the continent and develop new African ways of approaching sustainability in cities. Before we sign off, I just wanted to say a, a big thank you again to our speakers, to Abigail, Esther and Greg, and to Lita Bojo for her fantastic facilitation of, of our session this afternoon. I'd also like to thank um, the team on, on our side, um, Ines Hutanasha, Josie, and others who've been working behind the scenes on, on preparing for today and for the website. 
and to Michael, our web designer, who's been working day and night to work out all the glitches and make sure that the website's working and up and running. And lastly, to our sponsors, the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management, who have made this project possible and have, have uh, been supporting us on the website. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Africa Day. And um, please reach out to us. We, we have um, some contact details. If, if you would like to get in touch with us to partner or collaborate, um, please um, use, use the details provided on, on the screen. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you and good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.